um, and um, and they. This is very useful because when the Messiah comes, we believe. So now people around the world, they now know what uh, what is this, right? They now know what's going on. Right? So Christians and Christianity and Islam have served a very important purpose in preparing the world for the Messiah. But, but, age. Right. That's what this is what Maimonides says. Yeah. Um, However, they have also wrought a lot of destruction, a lot of terrible things have happened in the name of these two religions over the course of their existences, especially when they've had power. Um, and so these are, of course, negative influences in the world. So there's, a, there's positive influences and negative influences. Yeah, yeah, of course. But, I mean, I'm sure that if we were to take your reasoning to its logical conclusion, the assumption is that when the Messiah comes, is he going to have enemies? Um, I suppose probably, at the beginning probably yes. Probably. Is there a possibility that there is going to be war? There is going to be a war before the Messiah comes, that we know from Ezekiel. But after the Messiah comes? After the, the redemption, there's not going to be any peace. Is he going to have enemies? At that point, no. He's not going to have any enemies. No. Okay. It's going to be one what? final war just before Messiah kind of reveals himself. It's going to be the war of Gog and Magog. This is described in Ezekiel. And, and, and um, there's a little bit of description about it in Zechariah as well. After that, um, Elijah's going to come and say Messiah's coming in three days. In three days, the Messiah will come and Elijah will tell us who he is. And that will usher in this era of world peace. How exactly that will work, I don't know. Right, I understand. That, that's fine. Now, the issue is this. If, for example, you have Christianity, then came Islam, you view them both as false. On what premise do you view them as false? I view both of them as false in that, they, that their books contradict the Torah and that they believe that there were, pe there were people who were prophets who came after what I believe was the end, the seal of prophecy. Okay. The seal of prophecy, the, the end of the prophets yeah. um, for the world was the prophet Malachi, or Malachi. Yeah. The end of prophecy for the Gentiles, the non-Jews, was Balaam. Okay. Time before that. You know yeah, that. yeah, yes. Okay, that is fine. But again, I'm still asking, on what basis are you going to exclude Christianity and Islam? If I, if I were to say, because it, sorry, what you said, the Torah, it goes against the Torah. In what way? So, for example, so Christianity. Yeah. So Christianity um, has the idea that God became a man, right? Became a human being on the earth. This is very much contrary to the Tanakh, but um, can I, they, I know they without believe that there was a sorry, I'm sorry. What's your name? Josh. Josh. Listen, before you go further remember, about there were two what Josh's last time. I know, <laughs> I can remember now. The you know before you go further, look, what the Christians believe is not necessarily what the book says. Do we agree? Yes. Okay. It does say if, there. That, although I have seen Jesus says in John, I am I and the Father are one. I know that there is a Unitarian and a Muslim way of looking at that, which is that one in one not in essence but in some other thing. No, but can we can we not look at it, Josh, for what it is? Rather than saying it has got either an Islamic view of it or just looking at the statement itself. Because if I were to say, and because we are discussing it, we may as well go into the meat. Yeah? It says I and my father are one. Yeah? But the chapter or the verse starts off at verse 23. They come to him and say, if you are who you claim you are, the Messiah, tell us plainly. And he said to them, I have many a good works have I shown you from the Father. Yeah? For some more reason he equated good works. Yeah? But he also said, he says, my sheep know me, they hear me, they follow me. Yeah? No one can pluck them out of my father's hands. No one can pluck them out of my hands. I and my and the father are one. Now, logically speaking, the statement itself 
is making an association with the creator in a way which can only be understood to be blasphemous. It seems like that. But, like I said, if you look at the text and the evidence, it does not necessarily mean that is what it is saying. So, we see, if I were to ask you now, Josh, he said, I and my father are one. That's verse 30 of chapter 10. What does verse 31 say? No idea. <laughs> what does verse 32 say? No idea. Right, okay. Now, I understand, yeah? Because it is a common thing that the Christians tell us. But, verse 31, they picked up stones to stone him. What did they do? Who were they? Let's call them collectively the Jews. They picked up stones to stone him. He says in verse 32, Many a good works have I shown you from the Father. For which of the good works do you stone me? Now, if you reason it based on what you said, he claimed, or he made a statement, I and my father are one. They, like what you are thinking, thought it was blasphemy. He says to them, many a good works have I shown you from the father, for which of the good works do you stone me? Verse 33, they said to him, for a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy. For after being a man, you make yourself a... Now, I and my father one is not what necessarily we think it means. Because here he is telling them, I have done many good works. Which one are you stoning me for? It's like he didn't realize why they had picked up stones. Because if he did, he would have said, yes, I am. What's your problem? But he didn't, did he? He says to them, many a good works have I shown him from the Father. Now tell me, Josh, as a reasonable individual, they picked stones to stone him. Before that, they asked him, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Yeah, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. He says to them, many a good works from the Father have I shown you. My sheep hear my voice. They know me. Now, so far, has he said anything blasphemous? My sheep, my sheep no, know me in the full. He hasn't no. said blasphemy. He hasn't said anything. He then, he, yeah, blasphemy. absolutely. Then he says, and I'm glad you said weird because now you understand why they misunderstood what he said. Yeah. So he then says to them, "No one can pluck them out of my father's hand." Who? The true disciples. No one can pluck them out of my hand. Who? The true disciples. I and the Father are one. Now, there is an issue where we think he claimed, he claimed divinity in a way, yeah? So what happens next? They pick up stones. They want to stone him. He merely continues his discussion with them because he was talking about what? Good works, wasn't he? They picked up stones. He says to them, many a good works have I shown you from the Father. For which of the good works do you stone me? Up to that juncture, what was he thinking? It's logical. From verse 23, all he has talked about is good works. He has talked about his disciples. He has talked about the connection between the disciples and the Creator. He has talked about the connection between the disciples, the Creator and Him. And in that context, he made the statement, I and the Father are one. Now, it seems patently obvious from verse 23 to verse 30, he is talking about a sequence in which he is establishing clearly that me and my purpose is the same as what the Creator has sent me for. But they misunderstood. Verse 31, they picked up stones. Verse 32, he says, Many good works have I stolen from the Father, for which of the good works do you stone me? Now it's come. For a good works we stone you not, but for blasphemy. Now, what does he say, verse 35 and 36? <laughs> Josh, what he says is he puts up a defense. And you'll come across the word defense in law, I'm sure you will. Yeah? 
He puts up a defense. He said, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. Where is he referring to? The book of Psalms. Is that, is that before Malachi? Yeah, it's after Malachi. Psalms. Psalms. Yeah. The order is after Malachi. It's written before it, Malachi. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in, he has put it. In the, the order of, of Tanakh, Psalms yeah. comes after Malachi. But in the order of chronological, when it was written, it was yes. before Malachi. That's it. Right. But whether it's before or after, the question is, he has referred to something. He said, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. What did he mean? He's trying to say that we're all gods. Well, he's quoting from Psalms. Yeah. He's saying, look, God has already explained to you what he means. Yeah. And he says to him, is it not written in your law? Now he is telling them, look, you have grossly misunderstood what I just said. Is it not written in your law? I said, ye are God. And if the word of God came on, onto him, yeah, and he claimed to be the son of God, why do you have a problem? Now, have you seen the switch in the language? He says, I have said this. I'm merely claiming I'm the son of God. But is that what he said? That's not what he said. How has it suddenly switched to the notion of Son of God? My friend, can I ask you something? It's a question to ask and consider. But he goes on to finalize it and he says to them, George, he said, if there were gods on whom the word of God came, why do you see a problem with me claiming to be the Son of God? Now, According to the Torah, the appellation Son of God, is it a valid one? Only in the sense that we're all sons of God. Now, if I were to take that, Hebrews 9.27, for as many as are led by the, by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Not a problem, is it? If you go to the book of Job chapter 25, it says there very clearly, what is the son of man? Merely a worm. Yeah? Now, you can see the appellation is being used. The appellation is being used. And John 10, 30, when read objectively, clearly establishes that Jesus did not make the claim to divinity. And these verses I've read out are actually there. You can check them. Yeah? But a bit further than that, I will ask this. You see, in this particular verse, we have established it is not what you thought it said. Give me another one. Yes, when Jesus claims to be the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay. Yeah, right. sure. He breaks the Sabbath. Yeah. The Jews tell him, tell him off. Okay. And he says, he basically arrogantly says, no, don't worry, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm above all this stuff. Okay. But being... When he says he's the Lord of the Sabbath, okay, again, he contextualizes and he says, and you tell me whether he was wrong. He says, in Matthew 23, 23, he says, you hypocrites, you pay a tithe of men, anise and come in, and you omit the weightier matters of the law, namely judgment, mercy. Now, ask yourself this, what was the Sabbath made for? Maybe it was not Sabbath was made yeah, for two reasons. Yeah. One, yeah. so that we should keep it because God told us to. Yeah. And two, to commemorate God, uh, God's creation of the world and rest on Sabbath day. Excellent. Now, when it was established to be for human beings, was it for rest purposes? No, it was for the purpose of commemoration yeah. and of following what God says. Excellent. When God... Obedience. Absolutely. When the Creator told the people about the Sabbath, was it unconditional? When you're talking about Sabbath, it was, it was unconditional. Unconditional. So there is no way, even if your life depended on it, you could break it. No, it wasn't given, on the, it wasn't given in the circumstance of life-threatening situations. 
situation. But what if there is a situation like that? There is a life saving situation, then it does not apply. Sorry? In a life it doesn't apply. Does apply. Excellent. Now, take it in that context. If a teacher came and he made you realize, you know what? You took the law that the Creator gave, yeah? And you turned it upside down to such an extent that you made it so literal that there was no room for even a genuine situation to arise. Now, take what I said in the context of what uh, the Gospel of Matthew says. You hypocrites, you pay a tithe of mint, anise and cumin, and you omit the weightier matters of the law. In Matthew 5.20, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the righteousness exceeds the righteousness, have you? Uh, exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when I look at all the relevant verses, I find that when he allegedly broke the Sabbath, it was for a practical reason, yes? And the reason was? I'm asking. Yes. Apparently it was for practical reasons. You're right, you're right. But here is the problem though. I want to ask you now, if we go back to Moses, were there situations where he did something that was against God? Um, there was one situation. What? When he hit the rock instead of speaking to it. What happened? He was punished. And what happened after that? He was not allowed to go into the land of Israel. What happened after that? Was he still a prophet? Yes. Yeah, right. Now, here's an issue, if you think about it, Josh. You see, we know that those incidents occurred. But it seems like the Creator gave him a bit of leeway. Do we agree? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> well, he was still a prophet, wasn't he? Yes. Okay. Not exactly leeway. He was punished for it. When we talk about being punished, you have done something, I've slapped you, but you continue your responsibility. Yes. You aren't sacked, are you? Right. Moses hmm. was still an incredibly holy man. Of course. Sin, I have no one. doubt. The point is not that. The point is whether what we are alleging about Christ in the context of the Bible actually occurred the way you are understanding it. My contention is that is not the case. So the issue is whether it is true or not. We can confidently assert, at least I can, Brother Josh, that the idea of the divinity of Christ is not to be found in the New Testament. It's not there. They can claim as much as they want, but if we were to address it logically, rationally, and reasonably, the way we would want to address also the Torah or the Quran, then I can confidently assert to you that there is nothing in there which can claim that Jesus is divine. Well, if we can agree with that, tell me what is wrong with Christianity. So, besides for that, there is the issue that in the Christian books, the Gospels, they constantly misquote the Tanakh. Sorry? They constantly misquote Tanakh and lie about fulfillment of prophecies. So, for example, yeah. Matthew 1, 23, Yeah. mistranslates Isaiah 7, 14. And I, pretends right. as if this is a prophecy that was fulfilled by a so-called virgin birth of Mary. That's one example. Right? Are you are you saying that they've mistranslated the word in Isaiah? Yeah, they mistranslated chapter seven, verse fourteen. Take it completely out of context. Okay, That's but one example. That's no the problem. First example of many. Excellent. Yes, but when we are looking at these examples, we can very <laughs> we can. We can verify. We, <laughs> it's all right, George. We can verify one thing, yeah. That whatever we are saying, we can establish that what they are misinterpreting should not be misinterpreted. Do you agree? Yes. But but if it is there, then there is no corruption, is there? <laughs> Look, George. If, for example, Isaiah 7:14. The word is what? Bethula and Alma. No. Yeah, the word is Alma. Yeah. The word that is used is Alma. Where is this? <laughs> Shall we go in the sun, Josh? 
Yeah, yeah. Cool. that's cool. Thank you. We are going here for a nice walk you now. <laughs> Get out of the car. He just came and started <laughs> screaming. <laughs> he just started screaming what to do. Eh? We've just got to accept it and move on. Eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so are you in the first year? Of your... Yeah, just finished the first year. Oh, excellent, excellent. Passed? Uh, I think so. Oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, I think so. I'm sure you will have. <laughs> So do you want to become a barrister or a solicitor? Barrister. You want to become, I knew it. I, I just knew you were going to say barrister. Yeah. yeah, you've got relatives in there, haven't you? My father's a solicitor. I thought so, yeah. I there knew. won't be a solicitor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. we're on five o'clock. Are you joking? Are we already on five o'clock? Really? Right, well, our friend Josh here is going to be the last one then. Yeah? Right, going back to what we we're saying. So you see, you know what I mean? If, for example, the word Alma was mistranslated. But we now know that it is Alma. Yes. Yeah? And we know that whatever has been in 123, for example, of yes. Matthew, it says virgin. Yes. Now we can actually retranslate and put the word young woman. Right. So there isn't a problem, is there? If that's what we, if we do that, then we end up saying that Jesus was a bastard. Because we end up saying that Mary was not, was not in fact a virgin. We'll ha end up having to say she was simply a young woman who had relations with another man, not Joseph, because he is denying it. Okay, but that would be based on evidence. What do you mean? Based on... I'll tell you. Just because the appellation young woman was granted there, are you suggesting to me, because Isaiah 7.14 says young woman, Yes, it necessarily... Oh, it necessarily means not... Oh, right, so it's Are not you following? Here. Yeah, so there isn't an issue there. Okay, right. so, so maybe but not the only that... Maybe translation won't be an issue. Exactly. taking out of context is certainly an issue. Uh, yeah, but because that would only happen... Because yeah, Matthew sure. 123 is claiming a fulfillment uh -huh. of Isaiah 7, 14. Yeah. And this for sure is not the case. Yeah. Because Isaiah 7 is talking about a siege that took place during the time of King Ahaz. Yeah. King Ahaz. Yes. And this was a sign that the siege would end. Well, number one, the siege ended a long time before Jesus came on the yeah. scene. And number two, they, uh, the, if, if the siege had taken that long, yeah. that's a very long siege. Okay. Right? Besides the fact that the sign is not necessarily the son being born to this young woman. The sign is, the, is, is that he's going to be called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us.